I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. All right. Well, strap on your seatbelts tonight because this is going to be a real exploration of uh, some wild and woolly territory about which in Buddhist world, there is a fair amount of contentiousness even, or dare I say sometimes crankiness about what does it mean to uh, practice concentration. So before I get into any of that though, I just wanted to speak to um, the two things I was talking about in our informal get together before we began, uh, which had to do with the helping our beneficial states of being er, sink in to become beneficial traits durably hardwired into our own body, especially its brain. And then related to that, how to practice with craving and how can we be in life with its inherent facts that sometimes things are unpleasant, things that are pleasant end, and all experiences are inherently uh, ungraspable, unpossessable. Uh, because of their inherently fluid, dynamic, dependently arising nature. How do we be in the midst of all that without adding craving to it? Okay, I wanted to try to bring that down to earth in several experiential suggestions. First, with regard to helping your states to become traits, when you're having a beneficial experience of any kind, you're calming, you're relaxing, you're realizing, as I am recently, that you know there's just a limit to what you can do about a situation, and you're doing what you can. So you let that, you know, you have that experience. When you're having those experiences, do the thing that we don't usually do, which is to slow down to receive them. Feel them coming into you. Let yourself receive these experiences. Let them spread inside you. Be aware of what feels good about it. Stay with it. And hardcore neurological research shows that if you do those things, stay with it, receive it, feel it in your body, enjoy it, you are going to increase positive neuroplasticity in your own brain. It's as kind of simple as that. And especially... When there's a high value experience, like, oh, <laughs> go this way next time <laughs> when you're talking with your partner rather than that way. Or, ha, huh, this thing that's bothered me my whole life, you know, I, I understand it now and I can, I can shift in my relationship to it. Huh. Or maybe the keeper experience is, is really down to earth but very sweet, this combination of loving peacefulness, a kind of calm, warm-heartedness. When you find those big ones, really slow down and bring a big spoon and take them into yourself, okay? Craving. Craving is such a weird word. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, you need a heroin fix. Ugh, I need it. Um, most craving is really subtle. And a lot of what practice is about is becoming more granular in real time with the subtleties of your own craving and the factors of it. It becomes fun, actually. And you start to notice subtleties of insistence, mustness, or you start to can feel your body revving up to get a goal. I know that one well. Um, you can. Be aware of a positionality in your mind, like, I know I'm right, and you better know it too, <laughs> right? <laughs> Craving. Uh, a sense that you just can't tolerate something. You, it must change. It must change. That's craving in real life. And uh, even without you know, a heroin needle, uh, we can be caught up in craving a lot of the time.
And what is really interesting is to explore what is not craving, right? Like, okay, maybe some parts of your mind right now are kind of are, are, are grabbing or fighting, go away. What about the other parts of your mind that are just neutral, just hanging out, or actually are content? You know, uh, you can you can reach for something like a water bottle without craving it, without that sense of contraction and insistence, pressure, you know, stress, hallmarks of craving. Uh, we can take care of our bodies. We can take care of other people's bodies. We can take care of our minds, other people's minds. We can take care of the planet without that sense of contraction and pressure that is craving. That's really worth noticing. What is not craving? And also, what causes craving? What are the preceding factors of craving? And again and again and again, I think you'll observe that either there's just the habit of craving, which has taken on a kind of robotic life of its own. Or often, before craving starts, there's an underlying sense of, of something missing or something wrong, a problem. And then craving follows. So more and more, if you can kind of watch your mind starting to crave and then kind of catch it early on, you can really ask yourself, what's missing? What's wrong here? if at all. And if something is missing or wrong, can you address it as best you can? And also, can you address it without getting tense, contracted, pressured, and driven about it, full of craving? Very often, you'll find that that inquiry, do I really need to crave here? Maybe you do. You know, I've <laughs> been in situations in wilderness or protecting my family where, yeah, okay, I was craving. I was craving. And I'm proud of it, or at least I'm not ashamed of it. But much of the time, most of the time, we can be very passionate. We can be enthusiastic. We can be active. We can be strong. We can be firm. We can feel our feelings. Um, you know, We can set really clear boundaries. I'm seeing what Margaret's written here. We can be firm about it. We can be intense about it. But we're not hijacked. We're not hijacked by craving. Okay. So anyway, it's a really, really, really useful exploration and inquiry. And one of the things that can help us to crave less is gradually to cultivate the seven factors of awakening, which is my transition here. So we've been exploring these seven factors, which are described psychologically. They're not, there's nothing woo-woo or metaphysical about them. Uh, they're not uh, magical or they're straightforward. What are the seven factors? The usual list starts with mindfulness, then investigation, energy, bliss, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Those are the seven. So we've gone through them. We're now up to concentration. So I want to put that into context because in many ways, I think, especially in Western Buddhism, concentration and related matters such as the element of the Eightfold Path that is right concentration, consisting of the four jhanas, these non-ordinary states of consciousness. If there's one area in Buddhism where there's a lot of controversy and different views and um, attitude, uh, that's concentration. So I want to take a little bit with you here and kind of lay a foundation for it. Uh, First, if you know about the so-called three pillars of practice in Buddhism, in Pali, a key language of early Buddhism, they're described as sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila being restraint, morality, virtue, including positive expressions of virtue, not just, for example, restraining from stealing, but practicing appropriate authentic generosity, sila. Second, samadhi, which involves really training and purifying your own mind, grounded in your living body, which includes certain kinds of meditative trainings well known to the Buddha of his time as a deeply practiced yogi. 
meditative trainings that start to feel like you are no longer in Kansas anymore. It's different, non-ordinary, unusual states of consciousness, even extremely unusual ones, samadhi. And then there is panya, <clears throat> wisdom. <clears throat> Buddhas, Buddhism has a strong emphasis on wisdom, insight. Uh, the Eightfold Path the, typically begins in, in the usual list with right view, wisdom, how we see things. Um, one of the great benefits of uh, concentration practices and samadhi trainings is that they foster penetrating insight. Vipassana is the Pali for insight that brings us radically liberating insight in wisdom. After which, yeah, you come back down from the mountain into ordinary life after the ecstasy, the laundry, as, as Jack Cornfield puts it, but the view has forever changed. You know something now in a different kind of way. Something has shifted inside you in terms of how you recognize uh, the nature of your own experiences and the nature of reality, the nature of all thoughts and things. There's a wonderful traditional metaphor about the combination of samadhi and panya, concentration and insight. Uh, it is said that we are all sort of lost in a forest of suffering. And in the distance, we see the beautiful mountains of awakening, of happiness. And what do we do? Well, the first thing is we only need to cut a trail through the forest of suffering to get to the, the mountain. We don't need to cut down the whole forest. That's good news. Second, if we're to cut down the forest to make a, pardon me, if we're to cut a trail for ourselves, we could do so with a big blunt stick. Not gonna make much headway, right? Powerful, but blunt. Or we could get a really sharp razor blade or small knife and you know, cut away, cut away at the trees, the brush, and so forth. We might make a little progress, but really slow going. When you combine samadhi and vipassana, when you combine concentration and insight, you have what's in effect a razor sharp, heavy machete. And you can cut your trail to happiness, peace, and love and the mountain of awakening. The two together. Uh, as Western Buddhism has been introduced, at least in my experience of it, um, in certainly the more Theravadan flavors of it associated with insight practice with Vipassana, such as with places like Spirit Rock Meditation Center, Insight Meditation Society, and other places, my personal observation uh, from kind of seeing the scene now for almost 40 years, um, is that in the beginning there was a lot of reluctance to explore concentration practices, even though it's an eightfold path, not a sevenfold one. And there, was a, there were concerns that were voiced by people I respect immensely, teachers of my own, that you know when you take traditional trainings of concentration development, which have a kind of path to them typically, with a significant amount of effort. And sometimes you don't succeed at it for a while. Uh, in monastic settings, in Burma, Thailand, that was would be managed well with very experienced teachers. But to sort of drop those practices in a Western context in which the people tend to be competitive and goal-directed and overly caught up in striving and comparing and self-criticism, eh, there seemed like there could be some potential pitfalls there. Also, we don't have a culture that is really well prepared for non-ordinary you know, experiences. Um, and people can have you know, significant uh, issues with them, as Dr. Willoughby Britton and others have pointed out uh, in, in, in some cases. Uh, vulnerable people, particularly vulnerable people in particularly intensive environments like sustained intensive retreat practice. Okay, but there's been a growing awareness, certainly over the last 10 years, that it is an eightfold path and it is important to bring in um, attention to 
the right concentration element of practice and to samadhi practice broadly in general, which uh, for which uh, Buddhism has no monopoly. Uh, the samadhi practices that the Buddha became trained in himself and taught uh, were, you know, preceded him. They were well known before he came on the scene. And um, it is also true that many other traditions, including of the indigenous people around the world, have a deep appreciation for the liberating power of a concentrated mind. Uh, I mean mind in the broadest sense, not just intellect. And the liberating power, the transformative power of non-ordinary experiences. Obviously, currently, recently, there's a lot of interest in uh, plant medicines and theogens, psychedelics, as they were called when I was, you know, doing them uh, back in the day in my 20s. And um, so, you know, those are obviously non-ordinary experiences, and they can be, as much research has shown, extremely effective, particularly in well-resourced, you know, careful environments. Um, so here we are, realizing that there are three pillars of practice, not just two. Samadhi is one of them. Realizing that it's an eightfold path, not a sevenfold path. And realizing that we can be aware of the pitfalls of certain kinds in concentration training and deeply absorbed experiences. We can be aware of those pitfalls while not falling into the pits through being careful, taking our time, and working with good teachers, and um, supporting ourselves in other ways, so that if and when we start dropping in to these, wow, unusual states of being, um, we're not already so fragmented and dissociated that we can become even shattered or disturbed by those experiences. So how do we do it then? What are some of the useful guides here? If you're interested in deepening your own steadiness of mind and taking advantage of the full path laid out before us by the Buddha, who had no secret teachings, uh, certainly not in terms of original early Buddhism. There were claims of secret teachings that came along later, but most scholars understand or recognize that those texts were developed many, many centuries, if not a thousand years or so after the Buddha passed away. So the Buddha offered the whole path, which was remarkable. He offered it to householders, uh, which was certainly controversial at his time. He offered it to, to women, um, which was really controversial at his time and is still uh, poorly managed in many, many quarters in Buddhism with re reforms that are long, long overdue that said the offering was made available in principle to, to everyone. Um, and as the Buddha said, this path is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. So in that spirit of adventure, while, you know, knowing that, you know, the more you sail out into the deep waters where the, you know, some storms can come, the more you need to batten down the hatches and know what you're doing. But with that approach, with that approach, how can we train in this area? So I want to describe some of the trainings that I've experienced and um, been taught. Uh, there are many teachers who are real teachers of right concentration and very, very realized themselves. So I think, and I've learned uh, what I've learned uh, from them. And so I'm, I'll try to do justice to them right now by mentioning some. And, and those of you who are um, making comments in the chat, feel free to suggest things if I'm leaving them out in no particular order, in no particular order. Um, and actually, before I mention these teachers, I want to speak to something that a comment that was made in, in previous weeks. Um, no teacher is perfect. And, Eve, and good intentions can sometimes have bad outcomes. Uh, and so uh, the fact that I'm naming um, these as options for you, as resources for you, doesn't mean that you might have a, does not mean that you for sure guaranteed or to have only good results. I don't know. 
Um, I've had good results with them. That's what I can name. Okay. So uh, Steven Snyder, uh, just extremely realized being, deep, deep teacher, someone I've gained immensely from. Tina Rasmussen, uh, for a time his teaching partner and, and wife, uh, also deeply trained, deeply realized. Uh, Tina Rasmussen. Uh, together, they wrote a book whose title escapes me, might be practicing with the jhanas, based on their training uh, with Pa Ok Sayadaw, a meditation master um, in Southeast Asia. Also, of course, Richard Shankman, a uh, wonderful teacher, a beautiful book about uh, the jhanas. Uh, Lee Brasington, who I've um, spoken with quite personally, as well as with Tina and uh, Stephen, really, really erudite, deeply knowledgeable about early Buddhism, and a deep, deep teacher of the jhanas. Um, gosh, some others will come to mind in a moment, I'm sure. Oh yeah, Shyla Catherine. Um, I tend to be West Coast centered here, so forgive me, you East Coasters. I'm sure there are many, many others, many, many others, and whether it's in Buddhism or outside of the Buddhist frame. Shyla Catherine, whew, super duper teacher. Um, and I know there will be another two or three that will come to me. Really, really good. Really, really good. Okay. So, and before I go any further, I need to make another distinction between the jhanas, which are by definition non-ordinary states of consciousness. I want to make a distinction between them and classic non-dual self-transcendent experiences, which are really the nature of, in Zen, Kensho or Satori. Here I'm relying on my friend and, and teacher, Henry Shuckman, who's been a guest teacher here fairly often. And uh, Henry has a wonderful book, One Blade of Grass, which really describes um, the um, process of Kensho or Satori in his own life and the factors that enabled it and then uh, the, uh, the fallout, the ripple effects, quite profound ones from his own breakthrough experiences. In my book, Neurodharma, I also talk about just the research on classic, non-dual, self-transcendent experiences, which seem to have a certain quality to them. For one, they seem to come kind of unbidden. They're not like the gradual, progressive, deliberate uh, cultivation of meditative absorption that one follows in traditional trainings of concentration in, in certainly Southeast Asia, in the Theravadan tradition, toward um, deep absorption states. So they're sudden. Second, the sense of self dramatically falls away. It's like almost a switch flips. And again, in the jhana trainings, there's less and less sense of self, but uh, it's more like it gradually fades or becomes increasingly sort of porous and transparent, um, uh, wispy, but in a progressive way rather than just falling away. And third, in the self, classic self-transcendent experiences, which are widely reported and investigated around the world, the, the, sense, of, the sense of reality just becomes whew, really overwhelmingly present. It's like separate self falls away, sense of abiding as reality altogether, often with a sense of ecstasy or delight or like, or a sense of all questions answered, profound inner peace, tears streaming down sometimes. Wow. Maybe people get there, you know, through the progressive process uh, laid out in early Buddhism by the Buddha through the jhanas, moving toward, through the form jhanas and the formless jhanas, I'll explain all this, through then to cessation, then nirvana. <laughs> Conditioned experiences drop out, maybe conditioned reality fades and you're in unconditionality, you go, ah, and then there's a gradual return with lots of lessons from. That's a very different process. And it's not that one is better than the other. Uh, I've known that Henry, and maybe he'll tell you more about it, has trained in, in both Zen and he's had these extraordinary experiences, one of which was before he started training in Zen, just came upon him as a young man, maybe 20 years old or so, sitting on a beach in Central America. 
um, after a year of wandering through Latin America kind of on his own. Um, you know, he also, Henry, has trained in the jhanas, and he can talk about that kind of progressive training. So it's not either or. They're both really good. Uh, I can share personally that in ways uh, the jhanas are defined by many, including Lee Brasington. Um, I've experienced certainly the first and second, if not taste of the third and the fourth. And I have had my own Kensho-like experiences. Um, and I'm still on the path. <laughs> Still working on it. Uh, so all that can happen. Okay, great. I think it's also true that people, and this is very important, and this is actually a lot my own way, uh, people can very, they can just progressively, without a lot of fireworks, maybe occasional fireworks, but progressively thin the, the clutches of um, the fabric of self. It just becomes more and more porous and gauzy, you know, and kind of empty. And they can gradually cultivate a resting in a craving less heart. Craving less heart. Oh. It's still legitimate. It's still legitimate, right? And over time, you find increasingly that you're able to stay rested in uh, good heartedness and and a fundamental underlying peacefulness and contentment in, in more and more challenging circumstances or return to that core of yourself, that unconditional core of resilient well-being more and more readily, more and more rapidly, right? Um, and uh, that, that process of gradual development, gradual cultivation is really, really fundamental. You know, there's this Tibetan saying, gradual cultivation sudden awakening, gradual cultivation. Maybe the gradual cultivation, for me, it's been the great bulk of your practice. I think there are other people, though, who just, it's a lot of sudden awakenings. And sometimes they're so sudden and so profound that it's disturbing and problematic. And the, gra the cultivation really, really needs to catch up. Okay. Um, and then, as Suzuki Roshi put it, I'm not so sure there are enlightened beings but I am sure that there are enlightened moments. May there be more moments of awakening many times a day, as they say in Tibet, where you just suddenly, you're living from, you are living from what you know is true. Okay? Okay. Now, how do people cultivate uh, right concentration? <clears throat> First point, there are, I've heard kind of a range of view about what the jhanas are. At one end of the, the range, uh, if you have any s sensory awareness whatsoever of where you are and what's happening around you, you are not yet in a jhana. The other view, which is well argued by people like Bhikkhu Analio, Lee Brasington, and others, just takes a common sense interpretation of the Buddha at his word in the literal descriptions of the jhanas in the canon of the Pali language, the Pali canon of early Buddhism, in which there's no requirement stated that you must be um, completely oblivious to sensory experience around you, certainly in the first two or three jhanas and even arguably through the fourth. It's when we move into the formless jhanas, the the four that follow, and I'm not going to be able to just put the texts in the chat here. Maybe other people will do that for me, or you can go look them up yourself. These are uh, these states of being that kind of come after the first four jhanas, uh, in which uh, someone opens into, I'll probably get the order wrong. I have not experienced them. The base of infinite space, whatever that is. And there are people who know. Go talk to them. <laughs> Tina really knows. Stephen really knows. Uh, other people really know. Um, Michael Taft. Michael Taft, another incredible teacher, highly worth learning about, um, and also a good friend. Anyway, uh, so we have the base of infinite con space, the base of infinite consciousness. Then there's whatever, the base of nothingness, I'm probably saying that the wrong way, and then there's the base of neither perception nor non-perception, do, 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 and then cessation, Naroda. the third noble truth, 
about which many people differ. Uh, minimally, it's a cessation of all ordinary conditioned experiences and could be, in some sense, a cessation of engagement with conditioned reality altogether as the entry into Nibbana, Nirvana, and then a kind of return. So I don't want to get caught up in talking about things I have not experienced. I've really attempted to uh, understand uh, and respectfully explore different ways of considering these remarkable states of being. And I included this, this in um, the uh, chapter of my book, Neurodharma, that's about finding timelessness, finding timelessness. And so if you have an interest in that, including in the reference notes, which I really worked on and had critiqued by people like Lee Brasington and others who still probably doesn't fully agree with everything I'm saying there, so be it. Um, anyway, you could learn more about it there. Okay, I'm going to speak here about uh, the jhanas as I think they're straightforwardly described uh, in the Pali uh, uh, in the Pali canon. And... Um, so now how do we cultivate them? And you can take their description very straightforwardly. All right. In the Theravadan tradition, especially in Southeast Asia, there are five factors of the jhanas. And these factors, four of them are named in the description of the first jhana. And there's an implication of the fifth factor being present there as well. Okay, so the first of these factors is to apply attention. And, the, and in this training, this approach to the jhanas really involves deliberate, somewhat muscular meditative training. You're not just sitting on your couch, as I did for probably the first 15 or more years of my meditative career since 1974, just kind of spacing out, relaxing, and then, you know, kind of settling. Uh, your mind kind of gets quieter. This is deliberate, focused, sustained, and applied attention, and gradually uh, quieting the mind, taming the mind, finding that middle way where you're not fighting the mind, you're taming the mind, and gradually quieting it and bringing it to singleness. These are traditional um, instructions. So applying attention, okay? Sustaining attention. Pick your object. Maybe it's the breath. It could be the phrases of uh, loving kindness meditation. You know, may you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you live with ease over and over again. Or a mantra like Om Mani Padme Om. Or a word like peace. Perhaps the Lord's Prayer, if that speaks to you over and over again. And as someone who's interested in the neurology of this, I think what starts to happen when we really concentrate, we're leaning in to one object of attention, we're becoming deeply absorbed in it. The effort of that and the singularity of that actually starts doing trippy things to your brain and your mind that open you into other ways of being. And this kind of focused attention really makes clear how many habits of attention start trying to grab you and take you in other directions, and you just don't need to go. So the third factor, after applied and sustained attention, we've talked about before as a factor of awakening, piti, bliss, rapture, joy, something intense. You might want to go back to my talk um, last week or a week before last about this factor. Then there is the factor of sukha, happiness, contentment, even tranquility, just a sweetness. You know, uh, PT has this blissful, um, you know, rising quality. It can just, your whole body can start to vibrate in the extreme and really intense. People vary in how open they are to bliss, but I think we can all, barring someone in severe clinical depression or intensely agonizing pain, we can all find sukha. We can all find that kind of, uh, oh, sweetness. Maybe gratitude is an entry for you. Uh, perhaps a sense of enoughness in the present. Gladness at being able to, um, to practice altogether. Oh. 
sukha. And then there's the last one, which I alluded to in the meditation in Pali, ekagata. People can put the proper spelling in the, the chat if you like, those who know it, ekagata, where there's a kind of translated often as singleness of mind or unification of consciousness. The way I would describe it experientially, it's that it's close to what I explored in the chapter on being wholeness, the sixth chapter in my book, Neurodharma, where you're just present with your mind as a whole. You're abiding whew, as a whole, undivided. Whew. So you're single, you're not compartmented, you're not fragmented. And by you, I mean the whole you, not the contracted, presumed self, distinct from the rest of you. Just, whoo. and it has this sense of a kind of opening into it or plopping into it. Now, the nature of these, these experiences are that sometimes they come unbidden. Sometimes you kind of muscularly work your way in them. Sometimes you'll get flashes of them. What I find very often is that with a steady, with a, with a, with a firm application and a renunciation of anything else in your application of attention to your object of attention, like breathing, and a willingness to become increasingly absorbed in it, you almost start building up a kind of battery, a power. It feels like you're charging a battery. And then sometimes there's a shift. And when that shift happens, and there's a strong sense of... Um, PT of bliss or rapture or, or a strong sense of happiness or contentment or tranquility or even a strong sense of singleness of mind, you can make that your object of attention. Whoa. Christina Feldman taught me this. You can shift from the breath, say, and suddenly you can, you can give yourself over to and become increasingly absorbed in Concentration practices are absorption practices. You can become increasingly absorbed in this like swelling rapture in your own body. It feels kind of psychedelic, like, whoa, <laughs> a finger. You know? uh, and, or you can just give over to this really being awash in this luscious peacefulness of tranquility. Ah, pervading your mind. Ah. Of course, the trick is not to get attached to these states because they are very pleasurable. And, you know, to not strive and strain to make the next meditation as good as the last meditation. But if you bring the wisdom to it, these are trainings. And you, I think, will find, as I have, is that as you train in them and you start having more of these experiences, of just maybe deep calm, where you are just here, kind of unbudgeably here, and fairly effortlessly, minimal applying and sustaining of deliberate attention. You're just here. And it may be just pretty calm. Not a lot of fireworks, not a lot of bliss or even happiness, but just rock solid. Maybe that's a form for you. Um, so it's okay to have different forms. Value them. And as you progress, and I'm finishing here, I think, um, as you progress in this training, you will find that you'll become more, you'll have greater and greater access to steadiness of mind. You'll find a general quieting in your mind altogether, pro usually, probably, you know, along the way, progressively, many exceptions, I'm sure. Um, and uh, um, you'll find also a kind of purification of your mind. You know, these, these intensely emotionally positive experiences of bliss or, or happiness, uh, they tend to cleanse you. And you become, um, there's a kind of purification process that happens uh, in which uh, sort of the, the, the dross, in terms of smelting and metal, the um, the impurities, as it were, the afflictions, the hindrances, gradually get burned away. Uh, okay. And if if you're struck in any way, shape, or form by what I'm talking 
about with you tonight. My practice really took off when I started focusing on concentration and steadiness of mind. And I moved from being kind of a casual couch surfing meditator to someone with more focus and deliberateness and muscularity and training to it, trying to avoid the pitfalls of that. Um, if anything about this appeals to you, as it did to me, um, I encourage you first to play around with concentration. Say to yourself, you know, I'm going to stay on the breath for 10 tens. I'm going to count to 10. For, I'm going to count 10 breaths in a row. And then I'm going to start over with the next 10. And if you want to do that, you can use your hands like this, closed initially. When you get to the first 10, put out a finger, start the next 10. You get to the end of that, put out a finger, and see what it takes to go all the way through. Very few people will be able to get to 10 tens the first time they try. That was true for me, uh, and I think many others. And now that I've said that, you might be really challenged. Great, go for it. Um, so anyway, train in this and, and explore these like beautiful states of being. And then if you start to tip into some places that can feel really deep, you know, most people will not really encounter the jhanas in a, you know, a fairly casual home meditation practice, unless you're already pretty darn experienced. Rob Berbea, that's another incredible teacher. And his jhana retreat on access uh, to insight, um, audio recordings for free. Feel, I encourage you to give him a donation as I do. Uh, yeah, Rob Berbea, B-U-R-B-E-A, bless his memory, not with us any longer, unfortunately. Uh, he did a jhana retreat that's just full of brilliance and perspective. And his book, um, I forget the title of it. It's got a green cover. Anyway, wonderful book too. Okay. Well, um, that's kind of it. So first thing, if anything appeals to you here, go for it. Play with it. Just be careful. Don't, don't get dissociative or wait out there. Make sure you can find your way back. Um, but explore it. Why not? And second, connect with teachers who are more experienced than I am here. Uh, read their books. Do their online programs. See if you can get personal interviews with them, if that's possible. Do retreats with them. Um, and keep going. Okay. Well, that was a lot. I'm going to see if I can catch up. Uh, the last name, Berbea. Yep, I think it's B-U-R-B-E-A, potentially. Thank you, Eva. Um, let's see. Yeah, you know, someone here like, who is it? Ole? Yeah. He's making the comment that Buddha taught, he used the metaphor of a, a, some, a stringed instrument that neither too tight nor too loose a string. I've heard a metaphor from Zen that it's like riding a horse, neither too loose nor too tight a rein. That's how we should be with our minds, especially when we're doing concentration training. Uh, if you're following and labeling thoughts, that's not much of a concentration practice, although you can become deeply concentrated. You can become deeply concentrated in open awareness. You can take open awareness as your object of attention. And don't kid yourself, because if your mind is bouncing from one object to another, it will not become absorbed in one object. Um, also, absorption typically moves very far away from verbal activity. And the practice of um, following and labeling thoughts, you know, noting your thoughts, this or that, is more ver verbal activity. So even though some great teachers recommend it, um, it's it's not what I would call a concentration practice. And personally, I have not done that practice because I, I don't want to feed the beast of <laughs> verbal activity. Uh, and um, yeah, okay, so I want to keep seeing some more. Uh, well, let's see, somebody asked me, with Vipassana, which requires so much attention, it's hard to sit for long hours due to the body's discomfort. Yes, certain uh, you know, retreats will ask people to sit in an immobile position. Personally, that's not my style, and I'm not at all clear that that's a good idea, and there have been numerous sort of casualties of those kind of retreats. Uh, I think we can bring to bear an absolute fierce, if that's an okay word, a, a serious focus and a renunciate focus where we let go of everything else for this practice or this retreat we can really be resolute and diligent without hurting our bodies. You know, move your body if it needs to move and feel free to do shorter practices. 
uh, often with concentration practices, it's recommended to, you know, start with like five minutes, extend to 15 or 20, and then I find for, for myself, there is something that does happen when you bring, when you sit for longer and longer or meditate while walking perhaps for longer and longer periods of time, you know, like 45 minutes or even longer sometimes. Um, okay, so let's see here. The third factor of the jhanas in that traditional list is piti or bliss or rapture, Audrey, and then uh, followed by sukha, happiness, joy, or happiness, contentment, tranquility even, um, and then the last one being ekagata, singleness of mind. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of really wonderful comments. And um, next week, uh, I'll be exploring equanimity with you, upeka in Pali. Pretty amazing. Uh, and um, I'll definitely read the chat. Uh, I won't be able to uh, respond to so much in it. I'm kind of quickly scanning. I do want to speak to one thing that somebody brought up as I finish here. Uh, Somebody asked, does the lack of craving make life just blah? My answer is no. Some of the most not blah experiences I've had were on retreat where my mind was getting really quiet, very little craving, really present. And um, tahini with vanilla yogurt and a stewed prune. Oh my God. So much pleasure. <laughs> not blah at all. It's craving that squeezes the juice out of life. Partly because when we crave it, we can't enjoy it because we're concentrated around it. You know, we're clutching at it, Ugh, not concentrated in a good way. And also, um, when we crave, then we're chasing the next experience before the current one has a chance to sink in and be digested right? Oh, no. Now, I think um, apathy makes life blah and a kind of dismissal of life in a world-denying kind of way. Yeah, that makes life really blah. But the Buddha didn't do that. And as I read to you, I don't know when, a couple, three weeks ago, maybe or more recently, uh, in his own night of awakening or process, he really appreciated the, the wholesomeness and the wonderfulness of certain kinds of experiences. Uh, no? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And may your own steadiness of mind and, and that of other beings um, help to keep awakening all of us. <laughs>